I've decided to look at four key collaborative relationships with artists that I've developed over the last 30 years. One's a performance artist, Franco B. The other three are all, perform all have performative elements to their work. They're Martin Creed, Paolo Pivi, and Matthew Barney. I'll finish with a short look at some images of Michael Clarke and look at how an artist's work has an ongoing relationship with their own historical documentation. In fact, this might be a theme all the way through. I've chosen to look at some of the work I made with Cornelia Parker because I first looked carefully at Edward Woodman's work when Cornelia, Cornelia asked me to take pictures of her work, Cold Dark Matter, an exploded view. That was in 1991. Edward had worked with Connie on earlier work, such as the Pieces of Silver, which I guess is in the exhibition, although I haven't seen it yet, but I will today. Um, at that time, I'd mostly been working in theatre, dance and editorial. The work I'd done with artists had, on the whole, only been at the request of um, existing artist friends. Edward's work was so good, it was daunting. But at the same time, the job I had was to take pictures of an explosion. I just had to get the cameras to work at the right time and be pointed in roughly the right direction. As it happened, I did already know Cornelia through the composer Joss Pook and sound artist Graham Miller, who lived next door to her in a pair of houses full of artists on Grove Green Road in Leytonstone. They were demolished in 1993 to make way for the M11 Link Road. I don't know how Edward's relationships with artists developed. Geographically speaking, if I had to guess, I'd say that Beck Road and Hackney had played a part. I know his picture from 1989 of the people who lived in that road and see among them a good few artists that he worked with. I only recently learned that Edward had made the photographs of Helen Chadwick. I really should have known. I spent hours looking at their photographic perfection and wondering how she did them. <laughs> what I'm clumsily trying to get at here is that while Edward and I are very different photographers, it seems we have in common that we've both worked with, within communities of artists that have grown with us, adopted us, and ultimately trusted us to leave images in the world of their work that, are of, that have often been seen far more widely than the work itself. It's important to make a distinction here between the idea of community and the more business-orientated idea of networking. The collaborations with artists that I'm going to show and discuss require a commitment to that artist, to their work and to a process that may be lifelong. They're not reproducible, and there, are, and, there, and, there are, and there can only be so many. Interestingly, the photographers who started their working lives before the coming of the super galleries, like the Bermondsey Incarnation of White Cube and the Savile Row Hauser and Worth, also formed strong relationships, a community of art photographers, so for me, there was Steve White, John Riddy, and Edward in the art world, in the art world, and there was Manuel, Manuel Vasson in the performing art world, and Chris Nash in the dance world. All friends, all friends of mine, friends of each other. Community, not competition. And I'm not being coy here. I'm talking weddings, birthdays with zeros in them, FA Cup finals, taking children to the theater, and that's just Steve. So uh, <laughs> they were real relationships. So, after the explosion, um, a few weeks after the explosion, these images, sorry, I'll go a couple of explosions. That's, that's the installation view of cold dark matter. So a couple of weeks after the explosion, these images for the Chisholm Hill Gallery catalogue were made. And 25 years later, I got an, an email from Connie asking if I can supply a high-res version of the hot water bottle so that she could make it into a print to become her work for a charity auction. And this is probably the earliest image I have um, I've ever made that became the artist's work. There was no discussion about whose image it, image it actually was. I thought, about, I thought I might talk about the loss of cultural memory um, without, I'm sorry, written too many notes over the top of this, I don't know what I'm trying to write. Um, the real loss is not cultural memory. The real loss is always the negatives, um, or damage of the negatives. And the best images from cold, dark matter, these explosion images, uh, these the only high-res images, I've got no high-res images, they're low, all low-res images uh, from scans of prints uh, that I no longer have. 
And I don't know how the negatives got lost. They probably were sent away for a print uh, when I was out of, the country, out of the country, and then they were never returned from the lab. I do know how the subsequent images I made with Tilda, uh, with Tilda Swinton, um, as part of Cornelia's show at the Serpentine Gallery, um, they got damaged because and ruined because the people upstairs had a flood, which happened to be Sally Potter, um, who also <laughs> made a flood. I don't know whether there was some sort of competition going on. Uh, but now all that remains are a few scans that I have of Tilda stuff because the negatives were all completely ruined. Um, so, um, the, what was I trying to say here? These images are here, not just because they got damaged, but because there was another unforeseen transformation of this work. The performance was originally curated by Cornelia Parker as part of her show, but the cult cultural gravity was such that it soon became a performance by Tilda Swinton, and it became her work. Strangely, the direction of authorial travel goes against the general flow that can be seen of the last 30 years, where there's been a general acceptance in, in conceptual art of the primacy of the idea over its manufacture. Okay, now I'm going to speed up. I'll try and leave my notes alone because it's going to confuse me. So the first, first artist I'm going to come to is Franco B. Um, and this is a photograph I took of Franco in 1992 for Life Culture at the Tate. Um, this exhibition included the piece, um, this piece, which, which, which happened in front of... I miss you. Thank you very much, Lois. Um, <laughs> where Franco walked and bled. It, it was reprised here in uh, Brussels. Um, and while the pieces, uh, the sh photographs I've just shown you from, from the Tate remain documentation of that event, this particular photograph is now a Franco B work. So um, here I'm just really trying to get at the kind of transformations that can happen to images um, over over years, over time, and uh, particularly in, re in relation to performance work and the ephemerality of uh, live art. Uh, if I just flip between these two, they're clearly ch take, oops, they're taken seconds apart. This is work, this is documentation. This is work, this is documentation. It's, it's slightly meaningless, but uh, at the same time, uh, it gives you a sense of how specific images tend to, to to become something more than uh, the original work. Um, the other sort of big theme here is that as, as working relationships develop, so do uh, other kind of relationships, this other relationships, the relationships that happen within communities and, and, and friendships. And here, um, I stayed with Franco, documenting work, this is, this is in, um, uh, this is in Glasgow, but this was actually taken, uh, this is a portrait taken after Glasgow. So my, my familiarity with his work starts to drive other kinds of photography. And this is uh, a fairly little seen piece of work from the ICA 2007, I think, with Kamal. And here we here I'm starting to take more and more pictures around the event. Now, because it's live art, you'd think there is no gong or bell saying, now the art has started. Usually you have a sense that art is starting and that, art, that something um, may be more um, aesthetically controlled in the world <coughs> is in front of you. But a lot of the edges of these art events are very, very blurry. And particularly with Franco, uh, I came to realize that before and after the event was just as important as the event in some sort of way. And I'm not saying that this is necessarily uh, uh, important in, the, in, in making artwork, 
but it's also it's important in contextualizing art. And so part of the documentation with Franco became about before and after. And I can't remember who mentioned something about a lift. Did you have a lift? In yeah. Yeah. Well, funnily enough, I, this this this, um, this space, the lift space, has has also been a recurring theme in some of the documentation around um, the artwork that I've done. This is Franco in a lift in the Tate, and then with other artworks at the Crawford Gallery in <coughs> 2005, and that's a, a before. Strangely, here we have a before where there's pain and an after where there is no longer pain. And this is a piece of work um, which arrived out of experimentation. So this was a piece of work that wasn't a work. Um, it was an invitation by Franco to come and um, take some photographic notes about a process that he was interested in exploring which was to paint himself black rather than white. Uh, this, this is clearly not blackface, he's just an object painted black, like the other objects in his studio. He was trying to, if you like, probably empathize or morph into, to be more like the, the objects that he was creating at that time. Um, and this note-taking did, did in fact turn into a number of pieces of work. It was, it, 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 it came, it became something else. And so I think Franco made at least four pieces of work, his work, out of that note-taking. So whilst I'm trying to get across this idea that we're blurring the borders between where art starts and where art ends, what this document could be and, and what it can become, um, I also think that um, as a documentarian or somebody working with artists, you can't, I can't know where the most where the important stuff is until after either i just have to be with it as in as committed a way as possible this is franco's recent work which is more theatrical and um i'll i'll, I'll leave leave the tears um this is probably one of the first pictures i took of martin creed's work this is the band of wada martin and um, keiko wada they um they were at Camden Art Centre in 2005. I wasn't asked to take this picture. Um, and I didn't know Martin very well, but I got to know him much better afterwards. I probably took two pictures. I think I've got two frames of this particular uh, angle of the stage. And I was humping around a, a, quite a large camera, a large um, 6x7 Fuji rangefinder, um, because I felt that I should. Um, it was kind of what I did. It was part of how, how you identify yourself in the world. Um, uh, it, turned, it turned out that because it was a fairly casual event that nobody else had taken a picture. So it's the only picture of that particular event. And of course that can't happen now because everybody's got their phones and there's about a million pictures. This event would now be covered in you know, however many ways. But it's, it's nice that this is just the the one picture. Um, and then a relationship with Martin develops. It develops from actually from friendship through people we knew in common. And it, it developed into a very, quite a deep friendship. Um, and this included Paola Peavy, his partner at the time. This is a picture of Martin and Paola in Alicudi in, in Italy. This picture became the inner sleeve of an album. Now, I'm actually not working with Martin here, I'm working with Paola. We're doing a, a piece of work about the island. <coughs> uh, but of course, Martin's there, and after we come back, I often get requests, oh, did you take a picture of this, or did you? So this, this album, um, inner sleeve, was for this album, called Love to You. And this picture is actually uh, a potential Paola Peavy work, because one of the things that Paola had asked me to do at that time was to look at the bottom uh, of the sea and see if there are any interesting stones. So I was swimming around looking at stones uh, when I came across Martin. <laughs> and, and then 
Paola didn't really go for this image. She went from some other ones that you'll see later. But this became an album cover for Martin. I'm, I think this is actually a work album cover. It's got a, one of his numbers. So it's a work as well. If it goes on. This is a, this is a kind of thing of Martin's. It was a picture for another piece. <coughs> different thing. I'll stay off that. This is another Martin Creed album cover. And, and you know, Martin's a very particular kind of artist. Uh, this, this picture was taken in his flat in the Barbican about three years ago, four years ago. Uh, it, it also became an album cover. Um, but Martin had invited me to document his flat because it was so extraordinarily messy. Uh, 